In this presentation, we're going to describe some of the main terms and categories used uh, to describe rangeland plants. I'm Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho, and if you want to understand how to conserve or manage rangelands, you've got to start with a basic vocabulary of rangeland plants. There are four kinds of range plants we're going to talk about, grasses, grass-like plants, forbs, and shrubs. Grasses are the most abundant kind of range plant. When you think of rangelands, you usually think of some ecosystem that has grasses. There's a huge diversity of grasses. They're all in the Poaceae family, and they cover about 20% of the earth. And they vary from really large grasses like bamboo to really small grasses that um, are very ephemeral, like six weeks fescue. Uh, they have jointed stems. Uh, if you grab the stem and put your finger along it, you'll see the kind of knobs or joints along it. Between those no knobs or nodes or joints um, are, is, is an internode, which is hollow. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the stem is actually hollow. The leaves come off on either side of the stem. They don't whirl around. In other words, you have a stem on the leaf, a <clears throat> leaf on the left side, and then a leaf on the right side. The veins of those leaves are parallel to the margin, so they, they go up and down the length of the margin. That's called parallel venation. Grass-like plants, um, as the name would apply, they look like grasses, but they have solid stems without joints. Um, their stems are often triangular, uh, so if you roll them in your hand, you'll, you'll see that they kind of are tri triangular. The veins are parallel to the margin, just like they are for grass leaves, so the leaves have parallel venation. And most common terms for these plants are sedges and rushes. Those are the ones that we'll see most in our classes in rangeland ecology. Forbs are another really broad and diverse group of plants. The thing that unites all forbs is that they're herbaceous. They have very little lignin and they have very little um, woody material. So that term herbaceous means not woody. They have broad and sh leaves and often showy flowers. Not always, but often they have those beautiful wild flowers um, that we see on the range. Uh, when I say they have their broad leaves, they not, they're not usually linear, linear and narrow, although sometimes they are. So um, it's maybe the diversity of leaves that's important. Uh, they die back to the ground every year, so that herbaceous material grows up and then it dies back to the ground every year. They don't have woody stems that persist throughout the winter. The veins of the leaves can be net-like, they can be parallel, they have um, many, many arrangements. Um, usually we think of them as net-like, and rangeland wildflowers and range weeds would be two groups of plants that are usually forbs. Shrubs, on the other hand, are woody. They have a woody um, stem. They usually have several main stems. That was, that's what distinguishes them from trees. They usually have broad leaves. I'll go, again, the leaves can vary extensively. Um, remember, though, the reason they have wood is because it's lignified. It's got lignin in it. The, there's two terms that are important here. Browse is the portion of that woody plant that is eaten by animals, uh, by browsing animals. So deer, elk, cows, sheep, goats will all often eat the young stems and leaves of plants, and those young stems and leaves are called browse. Mast is an interesting term also. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about a, a mast crop. That's the fruit, nuts, and seeds usually come, coming from woody plants. The term weed is um, really general, and when we talk about weeds in this class, um, I'm really going to mean that it's a plant that's not wanted. So it has some undesirable characteristics that make it unwanted. The term weed is usually reserved for plants that are aggressive and persistent in their growth habits. So it's not things that are just sort of out of place, but usually we use the term weed because this plant is changing the ecosystem. It's invading into an ecosystem. Noxious weed is a very specific, special term. Um, it, it means that, that it is a weed that is so negative, uh, so detrimental, that it's designated by either county, state, or the federal government. And once it gets on the noxious weed list, it must be controlled. Um, otherwise, there's noxious weed laws that, that can, can be applied to um, either uh, control weeds for people or to um, actually give them fines for not controlling weeds. So that term noxious is a legal term. It's set by state and national laws. So it's a special subset of weeds. Lifespan is an important point. Does the plant live just one year? It would be called an annual. If it lives two years, it would be biennial. We'll talk a little bit about how that happens. And then finally, one that persists year after year after year is a perennial. So if it lives more than two years, it's called perennial. So annual, biennial, or perennial. 
two kinds of annuals in our neck of the woods anyways. There's winter annuals that um, start to mature in the fall. They germinate in the fall on the right-hand side of the screen. Through the winter, they go into a rather dormant stage and don't grow much, but just may stay green and just stay um, active. And then in the spring, they, that's when they bolt up and produce seeds. So they often can really get a head start on spring because they've already been kind of persisting through the winter and then they just go gangbusters when the, the, the temperature in the soil and the air gets hot enough. And then early in the summer, they usually die and they, they don't spend time through that whole dry, hot summer. Summer annuals, of course, are, as the name um, would suggest, they grow in the summer. So they germinate in the spring, they grow all summer long, they produce their seeds either in late summer or fall, and then they die, so they don't persist through the winter. So they're the ones that, that do not um, spend any energy to, to make it through the winter. They spend most of their growth during the summer. Biennials have an interesting growth form. They start in the spring, they germinate one year, they grow all that year, usually in just a uh, leaf forming stage. They don't produce seeds. They've just got basal leaves and they develop roots that whole first year. They go through one winter, they persist in a dormant stage, and then in the spring they start to grow again. And this time in the second year they actually will grow up and produce seeds, and then in the winter they die. We have quite a few biennials on rangeland, plants that persist as a rosette the first year and then, and then produce seed the second year. However, the most common kind of rangeland plants are perennials. They start at some point, they germinate, they may persist vegetatively for quite a few years, but at some point they produce a flower, and then they go dormant over the winter, then they produce new growth in the spring, then they flower, then they produce seeds, then they go dormant, and on and on and on. So they just have this, this cycle of every year producing either vegetative growth and seeds, and then going dormant over the winter. Origin is where a plant evolved. Where did it come from? If a plant has always been in the United States, it originated, I'm sorry, if, if it originated in North America, we call it native. It's native to our continent. Um, introduced plants then are those that were brought here from somewhere else, either intentionally or accidentally. Uh, they were brought here, so they might have been brought here intentionally as crops or as an ornamental plants, or they might have been accidentally brought as contaminants in seed or, or in ships or in crates or even just in the fur of animals. There's a special term among these um, introduced plants. Are, they're called naturalized plants. These are ones that were introduced, but and they're not particularly aggressive, but they're so well adapted to our climate that they live as if they were a native, as if they were nat native plants. Um, they survive without any human input. They're not terribly aggressive. So they, they look native, even though they did come from somewhere else. A good example in, in Idaho, anyway, is crested wheatgrass. We did talk about woody plants, and I used that term lignification. So lignification is important because it influences many characteristics in ecosystems, fire behavior, forage value, watershed value. But um, herbaceous plants are those that have very little lignin. They're non-woody plants. They die back to the ground every year. All annuals are herbaceous. They really don't have enough time to produce um, wood or lignified material. All grasses and forbs are herbaceous. Woody plants then are those that have lignified stems. So those would include trees and shrubs. And there's another uh, unusual term called, it, uh, a plant can be called suffrutescent. If it dies back to the base, but it has a woody base. Uh, there's some interesting plants like uh, winter fat is one that has an herbaceous uh, material above, but every year it dies back to the base and that base can be quite woody. So it's somewhere between a woody plant and a herbaceous plant and it's called suffrutescent. Season of growth is really important. When does the plant make the majority of its growth? If it's a cool season of plant, it grows mostly in the spring and in the fall. So cool season plants, um, Kentucky blue rest is a good example. It grows very early in the spring and then it will um, green up again in the fall. Elk sedge also, we find elk sedge one of the first green plants, in, in at least in, in Idaho, in the spring. But then you'll see it blue, uh, grow, uh, green up again in the fall. These plants flower mostly in the early summer and they provide really important fall, fall and spring forage especially at higher elevations. They're adapted to really cool and wet conditions and it has to do with the kind of uh, photosynthetic pathway they have, the actual way that they put carbon together in photosynthesis. Those enzymes are adapted to cool conditions and 
uh, Idaho is a pretty cool place uh, climatically, and so almost all of our plants in Idaho are cool season. On the other hand, plants that grow in the warm season uh, during the summer and in early fall, of course, they're called warm season plants. And when I said that Idaho is a cool place and we have a lot of cool season plants, places that are hot have, hot, have warm season plants. So there are some in the warm regions of Idaho, like down on the Snake River. But if you go to Texas or Arizona or New Mexico, almost all of their plants are warm season, of course, because they have those higher, drier conditions. And the reason that these plants grow in the hotter conditions is because they also have a photosynthetic pathway that's designed for these hotter conditions. Another term uh, somewhere between uh, cool and warm season is this term evergreen. These are plants that are really res um, capable of producing seeds and retaining seeds all year round. They're usually woody plants. Uh, and in terms of a photosynthetic pathway, they are usually cool season path, uh, plants. They have a cool season pathway. And that's probably because they need to photosynthesize or stay active all winter. So that is the season they really need to be adapted to. They are really important forage sources during drought and during winter. Forage value. Uh, some of you may be very interested in how plants provide uh, forage for both livestock and wildlife. I'm just going to use three or four kind of really general terms to describe forage value. A plant is high in forage value if it's very nutritious and palatable and abundant. So if there's plenty of it and it's edible, it would be called high. Plants of medium forage value are those that provide adequate nutrition, but they may not be terribly abundant or they may not be terrible, terribly palatable. So they're just kind of in that medium range. Low plants are those that either are not very high in, in nutritive value or they're just very not very abundant. They don't have very large leaves, so they're not uh, very able to support animals. Um, they don't provide enough nutrients. Poisonous plants is a separate set of plants that contain natural compounds that are toxic or poisonous to herbivores. Sometimes they also have a lot of nutritive value, but because they have these other compounds, they, they are considered poisonous. So they're a special subset of forage value, poisonous plants. So that's all I have to, for you today on the basic terms that we'll use to describe plants in this rangeland class.